thank you very much for this introduction and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I, it's, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here today and to address this wonderful group of uh, experts uh, in, in our field, the field of digital technologies in school education. Uh, so indeed, I come from uh, uh, Greece, but I also have been in Australia for uh, quite some time, uh, uh, from 2015 and uh, 2018. Uh, so I can probably share uh, perspectives from a more global uh, uh, view on this topic. So the talk of um, the evening yesterday was actually how nice it was to meet in person after uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, I will start uh, this uh, presentation uh, with um, some of the lessons that we probably uh, uh, need to uh, uh, use or uh, uh, from uh, uh, the experience uh, uh, that we had during the lockdown uh, globally. So, we all uh, were all uh, uh, forced to uh, move our teaching and learning activities uh, globally online uh, for a period of almost uh, two years. Uh, one of the things that uh, people are discussing nowadays is what are the lessons that we've learned from this uh, experience and how this can affect uh, the uh, education in the post-COVID era. And uh, I will uh, share with you some of my thoughts on this uh, uh, issue. Uh, and I have organized that in, in different dimensions. First of all, in terms of the curriculum, uh, the things that are important to be uh, learned by our students, especially in school education, the three things that I would like to highlight is that first, a better understanding on uh, the fact that problems that we face today and the problems that we we'll face in the future are actually global problems. And uh, in fact, the energy crisis has come to prove that as an, as a, as a, uh, as a next step to the, pa to, the, to the pandemic, as a next challenge to the pandemic. So the internationalization of the curriculum is probably one of the things that we need to take uh, um, uh, back uh, from uh, 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 the experiences and the crisis. Together with that, what comes as an, as, as a, as an adjunct issue is actually the, the need for developing uh, what I call, uh, what we call nowadays digital intelligence. It goes um, a step further than digital skills and digital uh, competencies. Uh, uh, it goes more into uh, the level of intelligence. And um, this is a now a mature uh, issue in the society. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, train our students uh, for what we call smart uh, citizenship, because technology has been a part of the solutions that we offer during uh, uh, COVID-19. So raising the agenda of uh, smart uh, uh, citizenship uh, uh, curriculum is, is also very relevant in several parts of, parts of the world. And um, the other dimension, I highlight this with red, is actually the ethical issues, the issues of uh, uh, being an ethical global uh, citizen. Uh, ethics is a very important topic. Yesterday it was actually raised related with data and uh, the use of technologies. I'll come back to that uh, in my presentation. Then moving from the curriculum to the means of, 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 of uh, 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 delivering this, uh, supporting this curriculum, Obviously, uh, one of the things that uh, we keep from that period uh, is uh, the need for um, more self-regulated uh, uh, learners, uh, the need to have our students uh, uh, being more active learners and also take more responsibility of their own learning. That was an important uh, uh, issue raised during the uh, COVID uh, lockdown and it was part of the expectation and, and not all the students were actually well prepared to do that because school is not actually preparing them very well uh, on that account. And the other thing of course is the uh, more flipped and blended teaching and learning is actually now taking place uh, um, as part of the experience of uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, when it comes to the technologies, um, the lesson that we take from the experience is that existing technologies have been basically the solution used 
uh, to support the emergency teaching, uh, uh, online teaching uh, during that period. So unlocking uh, the, these, the capacity of these existing technologies has been high in the agenda of which technologies to be used in, in everyday life. Uh, another dimension, in my view, is actually the assessment uh, for learning. Uh, yesterday there was an interesting discussion that that was the part who failed uh, badly uh, in terms of uh, using technologies to support it. And probably uh, uh, that's, that's a good uh, starting point to actually rethink the way that we assess, both assess, uh, uh, of assessment of learning but also assess for learning using assessment uh, uh, in our uh, teaching and learning strategies. So more formative e-assessment strategies uh, uh, can be incorporated in, uh, in uh, our um, uh, uh, designs, uh, learning designs, uh, instead of actually insisting in the old-fashioned uh, final exams and try to squeeze these, uh, the technologies to actually deliver something that is uh, probably not good enough in the first place. <laughs> and to that direction, the use of educational data can be uh, very useful. And finally, obviously, uh, one of the things related with uh, uh, school leadership and uh, issues related with uh, the autonomy of schools who was raised as, a, as an issue during the lockdown where schools, they had to actually manage with the resources that they had available, how they can uh, uh, continue working with, uh, uh, within the new uh, conditions. So, uh, the issues there obviously have, they have to do with uh, uh, data-driven decision-making and performance evaluation, uh, which is a, an old topic anyway, but it was actually revisited uh, uh, through COVID-19 uh, um, uh, lockdowns. So the two things keep, and the two things that have been identified as, as key is the digital readiness, obviously, both of teachers, but also of schools, uh, organizations, Okay, and educational data are a big part of it. So, this is a, one slide from the Digital Education Action Plan. I'm sure that you are quite familiar with that. Uh, I have just highlighted how many times in the priority two uh, issues related with digital literacy and uh, data related skills are uh, in fact uh, um, uh, stressed. Uh, so, obviously, this is a topic which is uh, high in the agenda of uh, uh, European Commission and European Union. Now, uh, I'll come back to the issue of educational data literacy. Uh, educational organizations and teachers are actually challenged uh, to personalize teaching and learning. So, basically, they are challenged to personalize the learning experiences for individual uh, students, uh, to personalize the guidance and feedback that they provide <coughs> to each individual student. But in some parts of the world, uh, the personalization is actually extended to the recognition of the achievements. I mean, uh, in some parts of the world, and certainly that's the case in Australia, uh, the graduates, they want to have a more accurate profile of their uh, competencies, let's say, uh, especially when they have to compete for the job market, uh, um, uh, rather than just have the same kind of degree with uh, just one grade on, on, on that. Uh, so personalization in, in is, is actually revisited in, in, in uh, 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 different uh, dimensions, uh, and it has been recognized as a key challenge for the past uh, 25 years probably in our field, the field of using digital technologies to support teaching and learning. So as teachers, how much do we know about our students? Uh, we all wonder, do, when we go to a lecture, for example, when we organize our learning activities, do they understand? Are they bored? Are they distracted? Um, in fact, we know, educators know quite a lot about the students' capacities and needs when they interact with them daily in the classroom or in the school laboratories. And still, in this context, they want to be able to discover even more if they want to personalize their teaching for each one of their students to differentiate their instruction. So one wonders what happens when teaching and learning actually moves from the physical space to the online virtual spaces, either 
thoroughly, or completely, in online versions, or partly through a flipped classroom or a blended learning uh, uh, designs. And <laughs> even more, what happens to when, when teaching and learning moves from small groups that we have in our classrooms to actually a, a huge, massive audiences and cohorts that we have in the, uh, in the MOOCs. And uh, that's an issue, for example, when we use MOOCs for professional development, as in the case of uh, uh, teacher's education, or if we expect to use them. So um, online teaching and learning is basically supporting, uh, in, in a very straightforward way, uh, with uh, uh, course management systems like, for example, Moodle, uh, uh, which are mature technologies that uh, uh, are uh, used uh, uh, even by every single teacher uh, in, 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 in the classroom. Uh, so that's, that's there. On the other hand, uh, the assumption that we are making that uh, uh, the professional competencies that we develop, uh, either through the traditional pre-service teacher education programs, or even with some in-service professional development programs that I see, uh, the, the professional competencies that we, we have uh, uh, used for designing these programs, uh, uh, assuming the traditional face-to-face -face educational and training settings are not good enough for, for what is actually needed when we move both to blended learning, but especially when we uh, move to online learning. And this is something that has to be recognized and has to be tackled. And it's not only about the digital competencies, but it's actually about how we teach online and how we teach on blended learning uh, settings. So a revisit of the professional competencies related with uh, 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 teachers' uh, education is actually uh, uh, essential at this at this stage. I'll come back to that. Uh, a more um, a more uh, let's say a, a very recent advancement in in our field in the field of digital technologies is actually the educational data analytics. Basically, the use of uh, educational data which are generated uh, during teaching and learning, including the assessment uh, for better supporting individual learners. Uh, this, is, this is the key, um, let's say, mission that uh, these tools and these technologies had when they start uh, uh, pushing, when, when especially when researchers start pushing the agenda of, of, uh, of this uh, field. Um, as a result, many of the uh, course management systems, uh, they actually have nowadays uh, uh, some of them simple, some of them more complicated, complex uh, uh, and more elaborate uh, tools that can support educational data analytics. Nevertheless, studies, they demonstrate that these tools are not, I wouldn't say widely used, but very, they have very limited use in practice by school teachers. The same school teachers who can use, for example, a course management system like Moodle and many functionalities of, the, of it, uh, they... Um, they don't go even near the educational data analytics tools that can be are included there or they are available there. And um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, 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 studies uh, have demonstrated that the problem is, is because uh, educators are actually lacking the educational data literacy uh, competencies uh, and understanding to actually use such tools. So, <clears throat> uh, what are the benefits for, so I mean, we need to actually do something about it. But why do we need to do something about it? What are the benefits of, uh, of using the education, educational data? So, here I have summarized uh, the benefits for uh, three different stakeholders. First of all, the, the students. So, um, the benefit for students is actually, in my view, take better control of their own learning, understand better uh, what is actually happening in the teaching and learning uh, uh, process, and become more active and more self-regulated and more autonomous uh, learners, exactly because they have a better understanding of the, uh, uh, of the process. Uh, the 
benefit for educators, in my view, is actually to be able to reflect and improve their practice. I'll come back to that. Obviously, to support, the, ultimately, in order to be able to support their students in a better way. And the benefit, obviously, for, for institutions is taking a, a more evidence-based decisions which has been a, 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 an issue uh, and a requirement for, for many years anyway. So, educational data literacy, uh, in many people's view nowadays, and also including uh, policymakers, is a core competence for uh, all educational professions, professionals, uh, uh, including the school teachers, but also the instructional designers, the tutors of online and blended learning courses, as well as the educational uh, institution uh, leaders. In fact, data literacy is part of the teaching license in, in the United States for more than 10 years in, in several uh, uh, states uh, in, in US. Uh, so it's not really a new challenge for them. And uh, by data literacy, basically we mean the, in, from this perspective, the ability to understand and use data effectively to inform educational and pedagogical when you're talking about teachers' uh, decisions. And it requires competencies related with all sorts of activities that they take place in relationship with using uh, educational data, the location, the collection, the process, the storage, the analysis, the whole thing. So. <clears throat> Uh, yesterday there was an interesting discussion at different levels and panels related with educational data. I'll try to summarize uh, uh, my view about educational uh, uh, data. Uh, of course, they are collected and organized to represent uh, all different aspects of teaching, learning, and assessment. Uh, I would say that they include two types of data. Uh, the interaction data, the interaction between students and students, students and teachers, and students in the learning environment at the different levels, the activities, the, the tools, the content, okay? But also they include uh, data related with the profiling. Uh, so that was also raised yesterday in the different discussions. Uh, so we use data that we use to profile not only the students, but also the teachers as uh, it was discussed yesterday in the special group for the uh, teachers' training, uh, and also the, the profile, uh, the, the, the learning context, the learning environment, uh, which is probably missing uh, in, in, in practice. We assume that all learning environments are more or less the same, which they are, it is not the case. Uh, and um, typically, we, we see that such data are collected with uh, quantitative methods, those are numbers. Uh, but I think that we need more qualitative uh, input into uh, creating this uh, uh, um, uh, data. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, quantitative methods are the only way to actually uh, uh, collect uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, data related with uh, the educational process. And obviously, these data, they come from several uh, sources. Uh, typically, uh, works that you will see, they're actually uh, referring to data that are created by logs when somebody is doing something in an online system like Moodle, for example, or whatever. But at the same time, nowadays, there is a big, there is some movement, anyway, I wouldn't say big, to have data that are collected real time from, through uh, Internet of Things uh, uh, devices. We've seen some probably dystopic uh, 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 pictures uh, yesterday in the in the in devices like that being uh, in in the uh, bags of the students and everything. But probably we have uh, in the future we'll have uh, better, more uh, interesting ways of using the uh, the Internet of Things technologies uh, uh, for the benefits of uh, of this agenda. Now, um, one of the issues that I'll go a little bit one step be beyond uh, in relationship with educational data. Um, there are two types of, of uh, data. The static data, data that we can collect from, uh, uh, the, lear for, from the uh, uh, learners' demographics, background, and uh, perception. Uh, there are static data also about the uh, environmental characteristics, about the, uh, the context of, uh, uh, like, let's say, the characteristics of the school uh, or a university or whatever. Uh, and also 
uh, static data about the uh, uh, personnel, the educators uh, who are uh, working in a particular school or whatever. Okay. So these are more or less data that they don't change very often. And at the same time, we have the dynamic data. And, and these data are used mainly for the profiling, okay? But at the same time, we have the dynamic data, data that are created by uh, students and teachers when they interact uh, daily with uh, uh, um, the learning environment. So data related with the engagement of the students in the, in the learning activities, data related with the behaviors and the attitudes that you can recognize uh, um, uh, for, from uh, uh, students' actions, and also uh, data related with, with student performance. So these are dynamic data, they're changing. Uh, they are related with the, interactive da the interaction data that I've mentioned before, and they are actually quite uh, uh, important and useful. Why? Because the static data we already had uh, in the past. Uh, so the challenge for the analytics is actually how you can collect, process, analyze, and use this dynamic uh, 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 data uh, in, in the process. And a different way, if we go to see a different perspective on educational data, is this one. So we have for the same type of data that I've mentioned before, we have data that we can consider as input data. So basically, the student, the individual uh, characteristics of, uh, the, of the instructor characteristics, the school environment characteristics, the profiling data, the input data. The data that are contextual data, the data related with the profile of the uh, learning environment, including the curriculum uh, the, and, uh, uh, let's say, the. Uh, even the, the, the school environment. Uh, the data that are created as part of the process, the third level, which is the data created through the interactions of uh, students, learners, and the learning environment. And finally, the outcome data, the, the performance, the outcome, the impact. So these are probably two different ways in these uh, two figures to um, see the uh, the, the use of this data in different, at different uh, levels. And obviously, the technologies of uh, educational data analytics are relying more or less on, on three. Because, as a, again, one, two, and four, they are already there to a large extent, uh, even without the uh, educational data analytics uh, technologies. So, uh, the next thing to probably discuss is that people usually when we talk, they talk about educational data analytics, they refer to learning analytics, okay? And uh, basically they refer to data that we collect and analyze and report related with the student uh, activities. Uh, that's, that's okay, that's, that's very useful, but, but some of us we claim that without actually knowing the context and, and all the previous things related with the different definitions of educational technology actually try to, to support this case without actually profiling the context and analyzing the context that this learning is taking place, this information is probably not very useful. Uh, not useful for the educators uh, because although we assume that they have a good understanding of, of, the, of the designs that they have made, probably sometimes they might not have in the, de in the details, uh, and at the same time, not for the students, if we want them to be self-regulated learners or have more autonomy, uh, I think the difficulty there is that they are actually missing the, the, the view of the uh, 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 teaching context. That's why teaching analytics, in my view, is also very important. And by teaching analytics, I mean methods and digital tools that can visualize, analyze, and assess the teaching design and practice. And uh, quite a few people claim that uh, uh, teaching is actually a design uh, uh, exercise, and therefore teaching analytics is, a, is an important uh, tool in the hands of those who design uh, uh, things. Uh, and obviously, uh, the combination of the two it's the ultimate solution, if, if we can talk about solutions. Combining the teaching analytics with the learning analytics can give us actually the tools that can support the process of reflective practice, that, which is 
what we expect that teachers will be able to do eventually in their daily practice in order to reflect on what they have done, go back, uh, uh, revise that, and probably uh, improve it. So, uh, I'll go a little bit more on the teaching analytics things because I think that uh, uh, it's not widely covered in most of, the, of these discussions. So, uh, I see three different uh, 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 levels of use. One is the self-reflection and improvement of individual uh, planning that uh, uh, um, educators are doing, teachers are doing. So tools that can visualize the different elements of a lesson plan to speak a very simple language, and then visualize, for example, the alignment of a lesson plan uh, to uh, the educational objectives and the standards that uh, uh, they might be using in a, in a certain curriculum, like for example in the United States, or validate whether a lesson plan has potential inconsistencies in the design, like for example, uh, selecting assessment methods that they don't fit very well with the definition of the uh, educational objectives uh, and goals. At the same time, it can be a, a, a nice tool for sharing these designs with peers or mentors to receive feedback, uh, supporting uh, the communities of practice, which, is, which are very important in my view in teachers' training. I'll come back to that uh, when, when I speak about the lessons I've learned from the MOOCs that I did with uh, uh, educators. And then obviously the, the, the last level is actually, it's a, it's a very nice tool for helping the co-design and the co-reflection okay, of groups of people in common designs, in jointly analyzing and probably annotating uh, teaching designs in order to uh, allow uh, sharing not of con only of content, but also sharing of uh, a, 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 a learning and teaching designs. Okay. So in that sense, it is really a tool for supporting educators as designers of learning experiences and how often we actually see this as a requirement from this profession, okay. very often. Now, the learning analytics, the, basically the learning analytics is a collection of learner da learners' data and, and uh, in reality, from most of the systems that I've seen, uh, basically they are helping to uh, build more accurate individual student profiles. This is what uh, most of the, in most of the cases, this is how the learning analytics are actually used to have more accurate uh, uh, individual student profiles. I would even say probably uh, more accurate graduate profiles, but I don't want to go into that uh, direction uh, now. Uh, the types of, of uh, data that are related with, uh, with that is obviously the engagement uh, in, uh, in learning activities, uh, the performance in assessment activities, uh, but also emotional data. I know yesterday there was a big concern about uh, this type of data, the data that, that are collected from uh, affective computing technologies, uh, the data that they are trying to interpret the emotions of, uh, uh, of uh, a student, for example, the stress or the anxiety that someone might have when he's back home trying to solve a problem and he's getting anxious or stressed or whatever. But this is actually where we need to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> because this is most of the times where the student needs some additional support. So we can't really ignore the emotional uh, 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 signals and data. Uh, we probably need to make sure that we, we have uh, good ways of identifying them and, 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 and reasonable ways of using them in, in uh, our designs. So learning analytics in that sense can support educators to reflect and adjust and improve their designs that the teaching analytics have helped them design. But at the same time, they can uh, support students in their self-reflection uh, uh, um, uh, capacity. Now, uh, I thought that I will, I'm, I'm quite, I'm sure that you are very familiar with this, uh, di the different levels of uh, educational data analytics technologies. The ones that are descriptive, so basically the ones that, uh, that, that they use 
the past data in order, and they process them with um, aggregation and data mining in order to provide uh, an insight of, uh, of the past and, and uh, answer to the question, what has happened in the past? Okay, that's one level. Uh, the diagnostic analytics that they come right after that, uh, where you can answer probably the question, why did it happen? And start having some interpretation of what has happened in the past. And I think that we can draw a line there. These two are quite um, uh, simple to a certain extent. But when we go to the next level, which is the predictions, uh, and how easy it is to predict the future, uh, it's not very easy, uh, then the problems start. And this is the discussion that uh, um, our two keynotes yesterday had about the capacity of the, of the machine learning algorithms to actually predict so to tell what is likely to happen. And this is where we, we start to be, we need to start being very careful on how we use these tools. That's why I have drawn this line. And of course, we, are, we need to be even more careful at the next level, which is the most interesting part, of course, which is the prescriptive analytics. So if we know that all these things have happened in the past, and if we can actually tell with some magic algorithms uh, uh, what the future will bring, okay, what do we need about it? What do we need to do about it? So the two last levels are probably, uh, uh, they are there to, to, to tackle and deal at the research level, but I don't think that we have uh, credible solutions uh, uh, available at the moment uh, uh, to, uh, to, to use. So in that sense, it is quite safe to use descriptive and diagnostic analytics, and quite useful actually, in the hands of the real teachers as a tool for both for the analysis of the de their design, the reflect on their practice, and for, for the students to be able to have a better understanding of the process. And that's probably the safe area of educational data analytics. When we move to the predictive and prescriptive analytics, then we need to be much more careful and take care of many more things that are quite important as well. So I still have a, a little bit of time, so uh, I promise to come back with the reflective pra practice. Uh, we have two types of reflection. The, reflex, the reflection in action, so when, when we are in the classroom and we see that the audience, for example, is, is probably not uh, a very uh, enthusiastic <laughs> about what you are talking. You are trying to do something about it and, and, uh, and probably uh, motivate people uh, to, to engage in, in a discussion or whatever. So the reflect, the reflect in practice, which is what we actually do every day on the fly, okay? Uh, and the reflect on action, which is a more systematic process uh, of the reflective practice with collecting data, setting up issues to, to study, review, analyze, evaluate uh, after the practice, okay? This is part of what we call the uh, inquiry uh, and action of uh, uh, teachers as reflective practitioners. Uh, I'm sure that you are quite familiar with this uh, 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 framework. It starts with identifying certain problems uh, uh, in, in our teaching. Uh, that they might need more attention. We need to understand why uh, these new exercises that I have introduced, for example, in my math teaching, they are not working very well with this type of students. Then we identify the problem. We are trying to uh, uh, um, generate an environment where this intervention can help us collect certain data. We analyze this data, uh, we, uh, and, and then we are trying to do something about it, reflect on, on, on this practice. So easily one can actually see how teaching and learning uh, analytics at the level that I described before, the level that they actually uh, describe and diagnose issues can be used to support everyday practice uh, um, uh, at schools in, uh, um, in the uh, teacher inquiry cycle steps that I've uh, demonstrated before. Uh, or in a different way, support uh, teachers to be reflective practitioners as we actually expect them to be. This is, uh, 
I'm not going to go into details on that, but what I'm, the reason I'm, I'm actually uh, showing that is when I talk with, uh, when we talk about, uh, with um, uh, uh, teachers about analytics, we use a scenario like that, but then we make it interactive. So the teacher can actually click at each phase, okay, this is an interactive uh, 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 tool, and click at, at each of, the, of, of these phases, and then more information can come and tools uh, will, uh, can come and dashboards and all the things. So this is a, a, a resource that we are using to introduce through a, a, a case study uh, uh, teachers on the very basic concept of um, educational uh, 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 data analytics and literacy. And through that, we actually prompt them to go and learn more from professional development activities that, that, that can, uh, can, can be uh, elsewhere, like for example in a MOOC. So we start by creating the need, okay, and, and then through this interactive board, we are trying, we are trying to uh, support the teachers to identify what is actually missing in, 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 in their capacities, okay, and how they can, uh, what are the tools that are available or things that they can actually use to support this process. Before I go to the professional development, I, I should uh, mention that, of course, as mentioned before yesterday, there, were lots of, there are lots of barriers related with educational uh, data. There are barriers uh, uh, related with uh, access to educational data. It's not always uh, an, an easy process to do that. Uh, uh, the quality of educational data, it was actually mentioned yesterday in the second panel. Uh, the lack of time and support for, for educators so all these things, they need to be recognized. And as a matter of fact, in this uh, uh, um, case study, we do recognize these things so we don't have the teachers being uh, um, uh, put off uh, from, uh, from, from the potential uh, challenges and issues. Related with the ethical issues, uh, a good start is to be well aware of the GDPR requirements. And I think that this actually a very good starting point for everyone who wants to work with uh, uh, educational uh, uh, data. Uh, uh, go a little bit deeper than the, than the surface of, of, uh, of having a template in, in, a, in a, a, a tick box. Uh, and these two uh, uh, figures which uh, uh, they demonstrate uh, on, the, on the one hand uh, the requirements uh, and the, pr the principles and the challenges to comply with GPR and the other is obviously related with the control that individual learners have on using their own uh, uh, personal data, the rights that they have on the use of the data. And basically, I think that we have a very good starting framework in Europe, which is lacking in other parts of, of, of the world, actually, uh, uh, to work on, on these issues. So in that sense, we're actually quite ahead. Uh, now, the last part is the professional development. So what kind of uh, uh, professional development activities uh, uh, I have experience with. Uh, back in 2016, as part of my job at uh, Curtin University, and as part of our uh, collaboration with edX, I developed um, the analytics for the classroom teacher, which is actually the first MOOC uh, for the use of educational data analytics for by school teachers uh, um, offered by the edX uh, platform. Um, I think nowadays it has almost uh, uh, 30,000 participants uh, from 180 uh, countries. Barbara was very kind to have an interview there, <laughs> okay, <laughs> in the, uh, and she, she's part of this course as well, and quite a few other people. Uh, so um, it's still up and running, and people are still subscribing to that. The good thing is that it's quite simple. It's an introductory course for uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the school teachers. Uh, by that time, all uh, courses available on educational data literacy were actually targeting either postdoc researchers <laughs> or um, uh, data analysts and things like that. People who are 
probably don't need too much of, of, of uh, professional development in this field. So at Curtin, we thought that we should develop a course that is an introductory course uh, on educational data analytics for the classroom teacher. What are the benefits for the classroom teacher uh, and using that. Based on that, uh, when I came back in Europe in 2018, uh, we formed an, an industry and university collaboration, um, uh, industry being uh, uh, Moodle and, and other industrial partners and uh, the uh, universities from Norway, Germany, and us in, in, in Greece. And I led, this, I led this project, the Learn to Analyze. One of, we did two things uh, there. One was to create an uh, uh, educational data literacy competence uh, uh, profile, uh, which is actually missing. And I'll, 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 I'll show uh, um, <clears throat> basically what the message to take back is that educational data is the intersection between uh, the, the typical data literacy competencies that are uh, uh, needed the digital competencies, like the ones that are described by the uh, Digicom and Do, and the pedagogical competencies that are typically part of a teacher's education. So the intersection of these things uh, is actually what uh, uh, can create the requirements, let's say, for, the, for a competence profile on educational data literacy. And this is what we have done. We have taken a traditional uh, uh, data literacy competence profile and actually map it into, uh, into the combination of these uh, two uh, uh, elements. And uh, based on that, we built uh, another MOOC that combines theory and practice, the practice being mainly based on Moodle. Uh, um, the theory is related with the three things that I discussed today, an introduction to the educational data literacy, uh, um, uh, teaching analytics, learning analytics, and the combination of the two. Uh, and the practice is how we can actually do these things uh, with open source uh, uh, tools. And we are now thinking of moving that as part of the Moodle Academy, uh, but it might be also an interesting thing for, for the uh, EUN Academy as well. Uh, so out of this activity, we created these two uh, uh, books that uh, were referred to at the introduction. One is a monograph that with all the work that we did to define the educational data literacy competence profile uh, um, based on a Delphi study that we did with 250 experts internationally and everything. And the second one, it's actually an open access textbook that includes, so you can go and download it uh, for free, uh, and includes, uh, let's say, uh, material and exercises and, and uh, even assessment uh, activities uh, on building these competencies, competencies related with educational data analytics for teachers and for school uh, leaders. And they have been published uh, uh, in October. So uh, what the br future will bring, uh, I think the future needs to bring micro-credentials for educational data literacy. <laughs> Okay, uh, and, and uh, in other parts of the world, especially in Australia, micro-credentials are getting big and practical and they are used. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, also we will move into this direction uh, also in Europe, uh, start building um, uh, um, uh, the, on, the, on the policy uh, uh, processes that are already there. The, I think that the European principles for design and uh, issuing uh, micro-credentials uh, with all these dimensions that you see here are already quite mature at policy level, but I think that we start, we need to start moving into the next level, and the next level in very practical terms means that we build courses and uh, basically assessment uh, instruments that can issue uh, micro-credentials on different levels of educational data literacy. Okay. And uh, uh, that's probably uh, an interesting new activity for, for all of us engaged into uh, this field. So, I think I'm good with the time. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.